to me it was the professionalism and the longevity of it. I mean, we were, you know, once we were on the air, I think it inspired certain people to do, you know, other shows that were maybe a little similar or, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you know. But it, it took a lot of dedication and, and time to do any kind of public access show for any kind of period you of time. You sure you want to use the word professionalism? <laughs> well, anything we're under the Take No Prisoners banner? Well, I'm just kidding. I know what you mean. Yeah. We, you know. You're not talking about the skits. Well, I'm, no, I'm talking about the technical side of it. I'm talking about yeah, right. oh, there the you camera go. work sure. and Hester's editing, you know, and the direction. The Everybody but us. <laughs> well, I, you know, yeah, <laughs> something like that. But, and that was the whole idea. That was the premise from the get go was to make it. Well, it's like, you know, Ben was referring to the radio show and he didn't want people down there disturbing him and, you know, you, you know if you wanted to lay this out in a certain way, and that was, the, you know, the philosophy of, of the TV show was we wanted to be professional, but we wanted to look like it was chaotic, but it really was, it was we, got, we had a lot of good people on that show, you know, technically that helped us. Definitely benefited from people that knew stuff that w we certainly didn't know. Uh, you know, editing, uh, directing, uh, sound. I mean, it, I, I'm even less. Jerry's much more knowledgeable even about that than I am. I mean, to me, the, the TV show uh, was just like uh, I don't know any of that shit. It, tell me when the red lights on, I'll act goofy. You know, that that was sort of yep. a lot of my role. You know, I think. Well, at the time, we didn't. Spend a lot of. I was married at the time, and and, and I had a lot of things going on. I was, ta to be honest with you, I was medicated. I was taking a lot of drugs, and and that's what I would change if I could go back. I didn't spend a lot of time with it, you know. I mean, I would have. We could have done more skits. We could have done, you know, honed more things. I'm, I mean, I'm very proud of the stupid slot that we produced, but uh, you know, I just, to me, at that point. You know, Rivet Head was coming out. There was just so much pandemonium going on in my personal life that uh, didn't really spend a lot of time with it. And that's one of my regrets. I wish I uh, would have had more time. And, 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 you know, me and Jerry talk about now, it's like we're both retired guys and stuff. It's like, I wish this could have been the situation back then where we, it's like, look, we could have really dedicated, you know, a lot of time. And we, we talk now about maybe going back and doing something, you know, where we now do have time to make the commitment. But I'm, I'm speaking for myself there, you know, as far as re regrets. I mean, I, to me, I just treat it as like a one day a week party. I basically had one night, Tuesday mm -hmm. night, and we, we shot on that night. And half the time I was more concerned about getting to the bar than I was like, I'd do another takeout, come on, you know. <laughs> The, and, and I was going to say that, anyway, that's my same regret is that, you know, you couldn't have spent more time on the show, but I think, you know, it is what it is, it was what it was, and, and you know, it did well, and, and after he left or whatever, uh, you know, we still carried on. It, it wasn't the same show, but it had the same purpose in, in that it was featuring live local bands, and that was, you know, the main well, that, purpose of the show. That was the purpose? Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I, I do watch them occasionally, and, and it is nice to go back and revisit them. And I've even played around with the idea of approaching Comcast at some point. And I, I, I don't want to hesitate to say this because it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. But and just replay that stuff, to replay the whole series from you know the beginning to the end. Now, I don't know if there's an audience for it. Uh, I would think there would be. Um, but it was something I, I'm personally proud of. I thought we did a good job, and I, th you know, again, the purpose of the show was to showcase local bands, and we did that. And it was all a variety of styles and genres, and and we covered that. You know. That was something that um, uh, when Steve Hester was working at Comcast, he worked in the advertising department, and he had a friend, Andy, and. Uh, between the, two, I think Andy, it was from this Dagger Dan um, uh, animation that they did that Andy designed and, and wrote. I don't know how much Steve might have written some of it. I know he did, you know, some of the voices, but Andy drew it out, and that's where it came from. 
And I can remember one of the first things Steve and I talked about when we did our first show. He says, well, we've got to have a production company. He said, we don't have to register. It doesn't have to be legal, but we have to at least at the you know, end credits say some kind of production company. And he says, what do you want to call it? And I'm like, eh, okay, you know, and, but I came up with my playground productions because I, at that point in my life, uh, just recently divorced and I was looking at the world as one big playground or whatever, so. And, uh, and I think those early shows, I think that very first show we had a, a Dagger Dan skit that those guys had already done prior to Take No Prisoners. They just, it was something that they shared amongst themselves. They didn't really have an outlet for it. And, we had it on, and it's like, oh yeah, that's you know, that's cool. That's a perfect, you know, we'll have the little my playground productions in the year, and uh, we'll have this logo. The purpose of having a, a production company was so that somebody couldn't come along and take your stuff and use it without you know some kind of lawsuit. Not that anybody would, but um, it was an idea that I had. Uh, I just I liked old old movies and I liked silly things and. Uh, uh, we've obviously borrowed the theme song from, you know, Ben opened uh, Take No Prisoners Radio with that theme song, uh, Mr. Moto by, uh, I can't remember the band now all of a sudden, but um, it was, you know, a minute and 20 seconds long and I, want, I was adamant about following, opening the show the same way that the radio show was open and, and ending the, the show the same, you know, with the monkeys theme. And, so we had to fill it up, and it was just an idea. I came up with these quick cuts of uh, live footage from bands prior to us doing the show. We sent a guy down to the Capitol Theater. Be three bucks. A guy named Scott that, that Steve knew, and uh, shot, you know, Smiling Sacrifice and The Need and other bands that were happening to be playing that night, and we mixed it in with these old movie clips, and, you know, that was that. I think there's an appreciation. You know, when you're going through something like that, it's just, well, that's what's happening, you know. It's, it's like the music scene at the Capitol, or it's like, you know, whatever else was going on at the time. You know, the radio show or whatever. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's what's happening. And you don't think about it, you know, uh, ending or that it's chronicling a, a period of time or whatever. And I, but I, I would hope that people are looking back on it now and saying, I don't really oh, hear yeah. any feedback because... I mean, I'm up here in uh, northern Michigan. It's not like I'm really relating to a lot of people that uh, are watching it now. Mm -hmm. Doing pretty good out there. Huh? There's a lot of hits. That's good. I mean, it makes me curious. Are these uh, new viewers? Uh, are these people that were part of the scene back then or are aware of it? I, I would assume that uh, a little bit of both. I mostly. think it, it's... Pretty much a funny uh, and 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 well done uh, uh, capturing of you know the scene back then and and you can see you know you can watch some of the bands and you can tell you know that s some of the styles and the, the music and uh, uh, are a bit dated you know but uh, what a <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> what a vibrant scene, you know, that that was. And I think, uh, boy, it, the TV shows and these videos that, you know, and, and the restoration that Aaron has done is, is nothing but just a wonderful achievement, you know, that uh, encapsulates all that. You know, that scene is just so well documented now. And, and it was a tight scene back then, you know. Once again, you know, the, like the radio show, it was just a you know wonderful outlet. You know, Flint was uh, fortunate, and not to pat ourselves on the back because it was just you know we stumbled into it through invitations to you know Hester and, and it's just been really a series of back then it was very uh, just a series of just fortunate things with really great creative people the the Doug Arps of this world, you know, the Michael Moores, you know the you know the Phil Hines, you know, it just the list goes on and on mm -hmm. and on. We're just so fortunate to to be able to work with these people and, and be inspired by them. You know, and I don't I don't imagine that there was a whole lot of public access cable stations across the U.S. that were chronicling their music scene either. I mean, and uh, the fact that we got a chance to do that and did it for so long, and I think we did a pretty good job. And um, I think people 
I, I can't say that people at the time took it for granted, but I think they appreciate it more now than possibly they did then, because it was unique, you know, and it's, and it's gone, it's the past, and the only way to revisit that is to watch this or listen to that or whatever, and it, it's, it came after, it was inspired by, or it wouldn't have happened without taking the prisoner's radio. And um, so I used to go into Doug's and buy these cassettes of local bands and, that I had heard on the radio. And I'd tell Doug, I was like, man, you know, these guys are really good. Somebody should help these bands out, you know? And he'd always, his pat answer was, why don't you do it? Well, I was married at the time and I wasn't really going to shows. I was just, you know, listening to the radio show and buying music and that. And after, you know, I got divorced or whatever, I was really, I was exposed to public access TV for the first time. I would really, you know, I would lived in the city in a long time. And I was also renting a camcorder on weekends and going out and shooting some of my favorite bands. And I uh, was watching The uh, Smiling Sacrifice one night and it all just kind of, it's like, let's, I'm going to, you know, try to do the show, but I didn't know where to start. And my roommate, Tim, I told him about it, and we had a lot of laughs. Oh, yeah, wouldn't it be funny to be on TV and have these crazy bands, and, you know. And uh, he came home a couple days later, and he's like, no, I, I joined this volleyball league, and there's this guy named Steve Hester that is on my team, and I told him your idea, and he said he's been trying to do the same thing. And after that was just getting Ben involved, you know, to do some writing. And, and I was in a nude badminton team at that time. Yeah, and, I remember uh, that. You guys... It wasn't a very good team. You were in like last place or whatever. But you well, know. you know, I was hung heavy, and it, it weighed me down. You know, you know, there was a lot of shots that I could have got to had I not been so hung. <laughs> that have, I, is there a has, shuttle shuttle you know, talk joke Steve, to go with that? Or? Yeah, <laughs> that was that was the name of our team, the Shuttlecocks. We had it was like an emblem of a big rocket, you know, with with the big wing. You know, like oh yeah, to the I remember. I'd forgotten yeah. about that. Yeah, you guys had T-shirts and yeah. Anyway, uh, Steve Hester, though I, I mean, Jerry was much more into it. The original, uh, you know, uh, the onset of the TV show, and you know, I was pretty busy at the time. But he would say, "Yeah, I'm working with this guy. This guy named Steve Hester. You know, he works out at Comcast and." and and I was like, well, keep me informed, you know. And he was like, well, he's talking about doing like a video extension of basically the radio show, where obviously we were limited by just playing records and stuff. We could actually have videos of the bands. We could actually sit there and interview them. And then as it turned out, well, we had extra time. We might as well fill this up with, you know, if you know, skits or whatever, you know, just stupidity, you know, just put our own brand of, you know, zaniness on it. But uh, Steve Hester, to me, was like the, uh, you know, and, and you've just given the story how you met him. That's Yeah, uh, it, you know, it was meant to be. There. It was meant to be. I mean, it all just kind of came together. He, he knew the technical side of it. I was starting to know, you know, some of the bands and, and um, you know, Joel. And uh, the first show we shot was at Buckham Alley Theater because we didn't know if we wanted to go in front of a, a live audience or not, you know, because... Steve was worried about cameras getting knocked over and, and all this other stuff. And so we, we shot at Buckham Alley, uh, Smiling Sacrifice and Feast of Saints. And then I kept, because I wanted it to be live. I wanted, you know, and obviously the bands prefer, you know, the interaction and, and just the, the chaos of it. And he was like, ah, you know, I've got all this expensive equipment from Comcast and this production truck. And I'm like, no, nah, these, these people are cool. These, you know, these, these kids will, you know, appreciate what you're doing and respect it. And, there wasn't that many people there for the first show, no, if I remember right. No, it was just uh, you and I and a few friends and the, the crew. Well, the and, scene know. was always respectful. I don't know what he was talking about. Well, he, didn't, I mean, he wasn't familiar with it. You think people are just going to pick up cameras go, you know, no. anarchy, you know? Yeah, I think that's what he uh, thought, you know. We thought it'd go as long as MASH, but we didn't really make it. We didn't win as many Emmys either. Though in the early days, we did that. Believe it or not, we did get some awards from The uh, first year, we... We won an we, award. We for won like show of best the year, new show or best. something, and then we won co-host. I still have my little plaque in there yeah. somewhere. We won a couple of awards, and then it was like we were like this puppy that you know when you first get it and it's it's exciting and, and you like to play with it, and then eventually it turns into a dog and nobody cares. It rapes anymore. you, you know. Yeah, <laughs> gets on its hind paws and rapes you. That was sort of what our TV show was. Like. Eventually, they didn't like give a us dog any that more was awards. a puppy that you pet, and then. One night you're asleep and it's like, oh my God, this dog is moaning me. Thank God. It was pretty much sums up taking a prisoner's TV. <laughs>
Well, Jerry's uh, forte, and it, it was always, you know, he was just knew a lot of the bands and, he, and, and it was more of a people person than I was. He would always set up, you know, who was going to play, where it was going to be filmed, you know, all the logistics of that. Steve obviously was the director and the nuts and bolts technical guy, and I basically uh, just when I was on the show, my involvement was like writing the skits, and, you know, doing the Twin Peaks, and the, you know, coming up with that, you know, stupidity and stuff. But Jerry was the main, the main focus of music, you know. It was, yeah. When I had this this vision of the show, I mean, literally watching that that Smiling Sacrifice tape, and it all hit me. It all hit me all at once. What was going to be called? Getting Ben involved, you know. Uh, how it was going to look, how long it was going to be, the intro, the interviews, and all that stuff. It you know, was just kind of laid out to me. And, and when I first met Hester, he's like, oh, an hour's too long. You don't want to do that. You know, you only do a half an hour. No, you don't want to put it on every week. No, and, you know, and I'm like, no, no, no. You know. And so it always it kind of stayed. You know, we, we had the vision, and then when Ben left, we had to alter it a little bit. But you know, just, just live music, three interview segments, opening and closing. And uh, if, when Ben was, you know, wasn't there or whatever, we just, you know, threw in some videos, some old movie trailers, and just kept plugging along at it year after year after year after year until we weren't doing any more new shows. We were just throw, showing a lot of reruns, and then they very graciously said, "Hey, you know, you got to put some new stuff out there." And if you know, we're going to have to pull the plug. And I'm like, "Yeah, pull the plug," you know, because for a lot of different reasons, it was it, winding down. It was unfortunate timing for me uh, in in respect of what I could give to the show. And, and I would have liked to give him more, but uh, at the time I was uh, married to like uh, uh, you know like Marie Mussolini, and uh, you know the Rivet Head was coming out, and so there was a lot of you know things Tours I had to do and, and book tour and whatever, you know, it, you know, all the sex I had to have with this woman it was terrible, you know, just. <laughs> You know, outside of the marriage vow, no less. Anyway, uh, I mean, I, I really, that's a regret I had, you know. I just didn't have as much time for that. First year I did, you know, and we are on. And I thought that was, you know, I, I'm obviously biased, but that and I think you would have to agree right. that was the best year of the show because we had the good blend of the, the you know, off-the-wall comedy and, and uh, you know, and the great music, and obviously, uh, that first year or two, we we were able to highlight the cream of the crop of the yeah. bands. I mean, the uh, the Guilties, the Smiling Sacrifices, you know, the Rugby Mothers, the, uh, the Repulsions, the repulsion, you know, yeah. the From Beyond. I mean, the real. I'm going to forget somebody, and they're going to be pissed. But <laughs> you know, the, and then in the latter years, you know, it, we, you did a good job of just you know. Illuminating whoever was playing, yeah, whoever's playing. But uh, we got the cream of the crop in the first year or two. And I, I, I anyway, I, I just, I just regretted not being able to give more time to it. And and it's funny because these like Twin Peaks things and stuff. I remember at the time just being like, "Holy Christ!" You know, I can't believe that we're going to put the slop on the air. We couldn't. <laughs> we didn't have time. You know, I only had one night. And like I said, I was more interested in getting to the bar. It was like one take. It's like this is going to be. But that sort of became the trademark of the show. It's like, you know, and we all came to an agreement. You know, even Hester, the director, would say, "Yeah, no second take." It's like you you blew your line, big deal. You know, you know the mic was in the shot, great. You know, <laughs> somebody showed the cue card, whatever. You know, I mean, we were doing masterpiece theater here. You know, and that sort of became the trademark of the show. You know. Well, again, you know, we wanted to make it technically as. as professional as possible and Steve had a lot of experience he learned his craft in the army you know filming editing things like that and he had done commercials and, and, and that and but there was always this so he knew technically you know what flowed and, and pace and things like that and I looked at the creative things and you know sometimes we'd butt heads during the editing process post-production and that um, <clears throat> but you know again it was just um, you know it, it's just a feel you know, it's like any other craft or whatever. You, you do something for long enough and you get good at it. And Steve was good at it. And he cut those shows live. We had three cameras that would show up and a sound guy. And he's sitting in this, this production truck that had this editing suite crammed in there with the uh, 
whoever was doing the sound for us. <coughs> and we had headphones and we could communicate sometimes, but the, you know, we're on stage with the bands, the amps are going as loud and he's screaming and you can't hear anything. So he's just, he's just cutting all this stuff live. But as far as post-production, it was, it was what served the band best, you know, what, uh, if, if it was a weak performance of a song or whatever, and the band really, you know, kind of slapped it up, it's like, no, they don't want to see that, and we don't want to put it out there, so. Well, and once again, uh, a, a great thing about this show is, uh, once again, people weren't getting paid, you know. Oh. You, you had uh, proficient and talented camera people Absolutely. who were, you know, lugging around these heavy cameras in a mosh pit, you know, yep. swaying back and forth, you know, having their ears blown out, people that really didn't <clears> even <throat> dig that kind of music, but were putting up with it for the greater good of the show, and, and, and tip of the hat to all those people, you know, the Ken Hannons, and yep. you know, just people that, you know, came out of the Katarskis, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. people that just volunteered their time, <clears throat> didn't weren't really a part of that scene, no. But realized, you know, you know, I can make a difference. I can pitch in. You know, you need help. I, I have some knowledge at this. Uh, you know, let me let me do this. You know, and that's what makes made that show. That's what make take no prisoners. No one person or no duo or no. whatever. It just took a community and uh, of people that it's like this is our scene. So what I can give, my talent is yours. You know. You know, Hester didn't make that show. Humphrey didn't make that show. Hamper didn't make that show. It put though all our talents together with people in the community, and we all made the show. It certainly wasn't. <laughs> uh, I don't know. No nudity. <laughs> we never do it. Did any nudity? I didn't. I don't. Not that made the air. There was that Lee Williams incident in Beer Belly. Oh Valley, yeah. But. Well, we sort of censored ourselves on that. I really don't remember too much interference, you know, from them. I do remember uh, they wouldn't let us air the uh, two uh, promos we did with Michael Moore because they had some vendetta against him, which it was right seemed, after Roger and me came out. Rather and, childish, but you know, I mean, that's the word came down from on high. But they never really interfered, and no. in, in, you know, they gave us because God knows they had a lot of reasons like where they could have said like i'm not sure we want this representative of our station or our company no there, there weren't any really any restrictions other than obvious ones you know you can't blatantly swear and there's no nudity and things like that but um, you can't drink your bourbon out of a, a an obvious bourbon bottle <laughs> there was one point where they, we couldn't smoke in the studio anymore but uh, you know no wonder I quit. Under, my, you know, minor stuff. I mean, really, no, they were very supportive, and like I said, they actually gave us awards the first couple of years, which blew our minds. Because, but, you know, that was what public access was about, and that's why it was created. And they didn't, they didn't get in the way as long as we followed, you know, some rules. The problem with that is, you know, forgetting people. But I remember, like you said, Ken and Val, John Katarski, Joel ran camera on one show. Um, a lot of people I, I don't remember uh, that we would get um, like Phil Scarich, um man, Shelley Hollywood, uh, Shelley <coughs> Stewart. Um, I ran camera for quite a few years, uh, but like I said, we we had two main sound guys, Mark Allen, Mark Hudson, and, and you know it was a tough job. They had to lug all this stuff up up out there. Uh, do sound checks for like three bands because we, you know, we wouldn't just shoot one band at a time. If we were going to lug all this equipment out there and put on this thing, we were going to have, you know, three three bands show up or whatever. And these guys would come up and you know, you know, you'd buy them some pizza and you know, diet coke or whatever, and they were good to go. I mean, it was really it was amazing, and and, and one of those things that this scene happened because of all that. Like Ben said, I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who were involved over a long period of time who were passionate about it for, you know, Well, then we had the, experience. Uh, you know, like the mighty car crash art players, you know. Uh, this, uh, as it turned out, this little troop of so-called actors were, were really just basically people from the scene, you know. <clears throat> as much like, much like John Waters, I guess, when, he, you know, he made his first movie or two, you know, he was just using his buddies and friends 
that's what we did for our skits with Twin Peaks and <coughs> and you know memorable characters and reoccurring characters sprung out from some of these you know but <coughs> they obviously were it, it, anybody could probably attest not professional actors they were just uh, people you would see in the bar or, hey you know she's a waitress there I saw that guy over you know drinking at the torch you know <laughs> and uh, they were just friends of ours and mentioned some of their names I mean uh, the Steve Reddies the uh, uh, genocides the Devin Donnelly's the Marisa Damo uh, Elvis Ty Terry Ostrander uh, Helen uh, Scott Carlson did Bloody Stool, you know, character, and My Three she Lee Williams. Um, Lee Williams? You know. Unforgettable in My Three she Well, and one of my favorite lines, because, you know, the Twin Peaks thing started out as like a little thing, and Ben was watching the show, and he says, hey, let's do this. And then once, after the first segment, we saw what could really happen. And, uh, but I think it's like the third show or fourth or segment of, of Twin Peaks, we introduced two new characters, you know, Bobby and James, which is, and Elvis's line was, you know, like, here it is the fifth show, and they're just now introducing my damn character, you know. It was just, we just kept adding people and adding people, and, you know, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And Dave Steele. There's, oh, yeah. There's, <laughs> I mean, he was in two episodes, but he's unforgettable. He was actually just, uh, he played the preacher at the burial scene, and that, I think that's, Perhaps the best acting of the whole thing. Didn't flub a line in, in that, uh, not to pat myself on the back, but Steele wrote some of those lines, ad libbed them, you know, stuff. But that, that, I mean, that was just a funny thing, you know. We must not forget the uh, eight millimeter loops and her penchant for horse tranquilizers and rubbing alcohol or whatever the hell, you remember? <laughs> I just did that. I liked his biblical stuff that he talked That about, whole you know. funeral scene I thought was. Oh, that was brilliant, yeah. One of the great. Oh, and, and, and Tim set. Hahn, of course, who played Dr. Jacoby. Yeah. I forgot about Tim, who was, you know. You're right, we're going to forget people. But yeah. anyway, the, the whole cool thing about it is that, you know, it was just, and once again, you know, I think you asked earlier on the radio show, it's like, well, how would you go about accumulating stuff from the community, you know? And, and, well, they'd send it in. Well, I, <laughs> that was the great thing about uh Take No Prisoners, the TV show. Anybody wants to be on TV. We found that out. We could ask Everybody, anybody. Yeah. And we had that one scene uh, at One Eyed Jacks, you know, that was shot in Tim's in garage. garage. Yeah. And we, we wanted these women in, in basically garters and nylons and in, in stages of pretty much undressed. And we were like thinking, well, yeah, this might be a hard sell. <laughs> the first three gals we asked, like, well, I'll be there. They, they were out, you know, a few of them didn't have the stuff and they went out and bought lingerie you know? yeah. it, and we realized the power of TV and we never quite got to that uh, episode where Sheriff and Agent Cooper we had this plotted uh, you know were involved in a loving and, and had like some simul simultaneous fellatio from a bunch of women <laughs> we I always meant to write that in and we never got to it because probably it could have happened well, yeah, of course, you know the casting couch was renowned over there. Comcast. What was funny about that lingerie lingerie scene that he's talking about is that these women, uh, Lisa and uh, Katie, Katie and and I can't remember her name now, but they went, you know, they went and they, they had their clothes and they changed into this lingerie and they came up to me because it was always shot at, at me and Tim's, you know, we had this rent this house together, or whatever, and. So they they come out covered up in robes. Now you guys got any robes or whatever, you know? But as soon as the camera rolls, they're taking off the robes, and it's I, I couldn't understand the mentality of not be, you know you don't want the cast and the in the crew or whatever to to see you in. I saw right? your underwear, <laughs> but you're willing to appear on TV, you know? Half I'm naked. gonna have accurate fantasies about you tonight. <laughs> Never quite understood that, but I don't think so. I mean, we were lucky to uh, every bit of film, you know that. We could produce, as you could see, it was all one take stuff. I, very rarely, if yeah, there may have been a couple things we did two takes on, but very rare. So anything would, anything that we taped was getting used, you know. Yeah, it was always funny um, talking on the phone or sitting in a bar coming up with ideas, and it's like, okay, we did this, uh, you know, 
what's the most outrageous thing we can do now and how much can we get away with? And each time it was, you know, yeah, that's all right, you know. My three sheemans, yeah, yeah, we can do that. You know? And we throw it on the air and... How I did it, every Tuesday, Tuesday was my night out to go out, and so we would base filming these skits around it Tuesday night, and I would go over to I'd drive in from my house in Fenton, and I'd stop by my ma's basement, and my sis, sister would be there, and I'd buy these big cue cards and felt pens, different colored felt pens, and my sister, I would just make this stuff off the top of my head and just dictate it to her, and she, you know, it would just work, you know. It'd just be like the most irrev irreverent thing, you know. Uh, I might come in, you know, I'd have obviously have ideas. I was like, okay, the sheriff says this, then Cooper says this. And the reason Cooper... Uh, and the sheriff were always wearing sunglasses in that show because we're staring at these cue cards from a script that was like written like four hours before and is like the second time maybe we ever saw the lines. So we're just basically staring at the cue cards. And uh, But a lot of the people that were smaller characters in, in roles, they, they would, would they actually would take the time yeah. to memorize their lines, you know? Well, you you, you printed up... Uh, after the cue cards, you printed up yeah. scripts or whatever, and you'd hand it to them, and they'd sit over in the corner while we're running around setting this up and make sure this is going on and all this, and and they're they over there, memorize. you know, memorizing this stuff. I and, could, <laughs> and I we, don't know about you, I couldn't memorize shit, you know. I mean, just I don't have the ability to do that, but I can read. <laughs> um. Boy, again, you know, you, if you start mentioning certain bands and you're excluding a whole bunch of other bands, but um, I, I like Captain Dave and the Psychedelic Lounge Cats. I always liked them a lot. I think Steve did a, because most of, you know, most of the stuff was, the music was aggressive and it was hard to, you're doing quick cuts and all this and you can't be real creative. You're just, you're, because it's happening so fast and you've got to, you know, anticipate things and be there because you're not really a part of the band, but you want to try to, you know, catch everything. But they did, a, I, I like the style of their music, and they did a, a slower kind of show or whatever, and so you could be more creative and innovative or whatever. And I like that, um, but, you know, again, you're, you're leaving out hundreds of other bands that, that you liked um, or that I liked. Yeah, you run that risk. You My, uh, I, a few that strike me off, if you're just talking the music portion, would be... Uh, I just love the uh, set by uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, a band mm -hmm. from Ohio that was one of the few outside of the area that we were able to bring in. And, and it really, I, I really felt bad because we didn't have much of a turnout at the Capitol Theater right. for that. It was really, I was really bummed out, but the band didn't hold back. And I remember you, if you watch the video, it was so damn cold in there. You can see the, because uh, obviously the, the Capitol wasn't really functioning at that point. And, you can see their breath coming out, but they didn't hold anything back, you know. They just stormtrooped right through there. That would be one of mine. Uh, I was always, I always loved the From Beyond show. I thought those guys, it was like, you know, with Lee, and, and that kicked ass. Uh, the Rugby Mothers, one of my they always did a, favorite. Yeah. They just, uh, they just were good at that zany, sort of poppy, funny punk thing. They had it down, and they were tight. Yep. And, uh, Oh, it's the other one I was just thinking of. Uh, of course, Repulsion, uh, the uh, Guilty's 15-year anniversary show. I mean, that, those are highlights to me. But as Jerry says, you know, you don't. I mean, you know, you could go on and on. You know, the bumps. You know. Yeah, and when when, it, it, when Ben brought up the fact that uh, you you know it was cold when this band played or that band played or whatever. Again, you have to go back to Joel Rash and, and providing, and, and Troy Farah and, and, and his family, at, you know, for a long period of time, providing the Capitol stage or in the lobby or down in the basement or whatever. And we, you know, we'd do these shows whenever we could. Joel would say, you know, I'd say, well, I want these bands, or Joel would say, you know, like you might want these, and and so you, you, you try to schedule the show. It might be three weeks later. You might have to do it on a Sunday. It might be the, you know, the middle of the winter, and they're, you know. Troy and the Capitol Theater people were, were nice to lend us the space, but they're not going to turn on their boilers and heat this, you know, the place for you because they're not making any money off it. So you had a lot of bands that come in and, and you know, played when it was, because you had, you know, the doors are wide open and you got to haul equipment in, and you know, it's freezing again, in there sometimes. Once again, you know, the allure of TV, we just never, 
had to beg anybody to do anything, no. whether they be bands or actors. Or now, if you're talking about, you know, we talked about musical highlights. We talk about skit highlights. Obviously, to me, the trilogy, or uh, I call it the trilogy, but there's more episodes than that. The whole saga of the Twin Peaks, uh, mm -hmm. with, you know. But the Twin Peaks episode where we kill everybody, you know, <laughs> I mean, that that's classic. And, of course, the uh, funeral scene in, in the one is are two of my highlights. In the very first uh, My Three She-Males, I think that, I mean, that, if I wasn't involved with that somehow and I saw that, I would laugh my ass off. Like, this is just stupid, but it's funny, you know. No, I, I've, I've seen those Twin Peaks episodes a hundred times, and it's not just because I'm in it or whatever, and, and they're still entertaining to me. They're still funny to me. Um, and uh, I, I remember when we did the, the scene, or the, the last one where we killed everybody, I was at work one day, and you know this woman came up to me who was very religious or whatever, and she was just appalled at the violence and the gore and all this. And I'm like, no, it's like a cartoon. It was obviously fake, you know. <laughs> and she was just appalled by People. it. She, you know, and she knew me, and she, you know, I didn't think you were capable of something like that. You know, the Lord's going to strike. It was like cartoon time, violence. You know? It was. Well, so that's what I told her. I said, so "This is not serious. We're just, overboard. you know." But she was greatly offended by it. Well, my, uh, you mentioned a, a situation where you had to deal in public with something you did on that TV show. I remember when I lived in Fenton, going up to the bank, you know, the MBD that I, I frequented, and going in there, and there was quite a bunch of people in there and one of the tellers that a lady I knew it was one of the tellers she saw me as like third in line at in in line she saw me she she went Ben I saw you last night on TV in a dress <laughs> and all these people like looked around it was the yeah. episode you and me did in sundresses yeah. yeah in sundresses you know and normally I wouldn't mind that but you know, like in a bank and all these squares were like turning around like, you know what kind of like transvestite thing are you, you doing, buddy? Well, I agree. I remember that clearly trying on the sundresses because Ben kept talking about we've got to do one of these interviews because you were trying to be you know silly and outrageous and all that. And he kept talking about the sundresses. You know, we're gonna have to do an episode with wearing sundresses, and I didn't really want to because I didn't want to go shopping for sundresses. You know, and I was hoping he'd forget about it, but he you know he didn't, and so we went to this. Uh, this uh, thrift store and we just walked in there and said we're looking for sundresses and this lady helped us pick out well what colors are you looking for and we tried on jewelry and we, we we'd go in the dressing room and try on the dress and come out and show her and you know does this match the jewelry and because you know I but I think she thought we were shopping for our wives or something <laughs> so we, we were have bulky you know. wives <laughs> they have I don't, I don't really either. think she thought you know we were no no to stuff. me it was funny because she was oh, yeah. being so helpful and you know here, we'll, we'll try this one on. Try that one. Is this on, gaudy you know? enough? We, we'd come, come out. Does this clash with my shoes? Does this show my man boobs? <laughs> um, that was Steve's job. I mean, he would write these companies, and they would, you know, send him stuff. They said, hey, you know, he would write them and say, hey, we've got. I mean, I knew the labels from doing the radio show, you know, Epitaph Records and all these people, and so he would write them and say, hey, we're doing this public access show. You know, send us your videos and. Uh, they started trickling in slowly at first, but I mean, we were getting you know tons of you know stuff, and a lot of it was really good. And we always had our favorites, but uh, it, it was you know that was Steve's doing, and he stored them in his office. And you know, well, it's like Ben mentioned about the radio show. If there was a local band, you know, we that was the point of of the TV show. We'd, we'd throw them up there, and whether I was a fan or not it didn't really matter. And sometimes, yeah, I would become somebody I wasn't familiar with. Like I remember Joel telling me. Hey, there's this band called The Process from from Vassar, and you know, they're they're older guys. They're not like the you know the high school, early twenties kind of punk. But like the older, prisoners. You know, they're, old, they're older guys, and, and they're pretty good. You might like them, and and uh, I don't remember if I'd seen them before we shot them or not. But yeah, there was a lot of bands that I didn't know anything about, but through you know Joel's recommendation or, or here or there or whatever, and you know you'd show them, and it's like then all of a sudden yeah you become a fan because it's. Uh, you know, they were a great band, and they did well, and professional. If that was the question, yeah. yeah I took, simple. like, a personal umbrage, though, to so many of these bands would, like, kick my ass in rock star arm wrestling, you know. <laughs> I was thinking about that. Yeah, you know, always that? get paired up with the drummer. Well, of course, the drummer's going to have strong arms, you know. It's like, why can't I take on the, you know, Faye lead singer, guy. you know. Yeah. 
I was thinking about that today. How did that, was that your idea, the Rockstar arm wrestling? Yeah. Was that something we, you know, we talked about? I can't about remember or, where it originated, but. It was early on. It was just like, uh, we got to find something to eat up two minutes, you know. It's like, well, okay, let's, here, you, me, let's go, arm wrestling. You know, and it just became a funny thing about it. And I remember, if I remember, my, my final record was like 3 and 12, you know. It wasn't pretty, you know. It was not pretty. Well, another thing is, you know, you, you wanted, we wanted to do these interview segments to kind of introduce the band to the audience or whatever. And, but then, you know, you don't really know what to ask them. It's like influences, how you got together, and it becomes redundant after a What's while. What's your favorite color? You know, and so it was, it was another way to kind of break things <coughs> up and, and do something a little bit different. And, and the bands always liked it. I mean, the bands were, you know, you, the first segment was always the same. A band would come in, they're kind of uptight or whatever, and then by the second segment, they're loosening up, and then by the third, they're, you know, they're having a blast. And, and they're stone drum. You know, <laughs> smoking weed, and yeah. I would say lack of shows. <laughs> I mean, it it pretty much dried up a lot, you know. And I know, uh, you know, what was that last venue that uh, you know Dr. Schwartz played at upstairs there? The what? Hot Rock, the Metropolis. Oh yeah. You know, and they yeah. they closed, and then well, I don't know. It just it dried up a lot, and of course, you know. Uh, Joel's place was always very vibrant and stuff, but it, <coughs> I'm just speaking personally, it didn't really, uh, wasn't attracted to me because I couldn't smoke or drink, you know, and if I'm going to go see a bar, a, a bar, a band in a bar, or a band, period, I want to have a ciggy and a, and a, a cocktail, you know. A couple mushrooms and heroin. Yeah, yeah you know, have everything I can ingest, you know, and, and do Take my, your pants off and <coughs> do it to my system, but anyway, uh. No, I, th I think, you know, <coughs> I didn't give up on the scene. It gave up on me. Uh, I, I, everything comes to a natural end. And I, I, something I observed, um, observed, not observed, uh, is once alternative music started becoming a little more popular nationwide, you know, the Nirvanas of the world and that, the music tended to get, car uh, tended to get um, compartmentalized or whatever. It, you know, it's like... You instead of having this huge variety of music, you start getting, okay, now all these bands want to be grunge, or all these bands want to be this way, all these bands, and you didn't get the variety towards the end of, of our, you know, of our uh, TV show, and that that's what I noticed or whatever, and it's just, you know, things naturally just come to an end, it can't go on forever. And that's a good thing, you know, and now we're into different stuff, you know, and, you know, and then that'll fade out, you know, and then, you know, we'll you know, get on our oxygen tanks and, you know, play shuffleboard, and that'll be it. Sounds like fun. Well, this is something I've discussed with Jerry, and it's like, I don't know if it's a matter of uh, I want to go back and wrong or right or, or right or wrong, you know. It is, uh, yeah, we both got time now. Jerry's retired recently, and I've been retired for a long time, so. I don't know. I, I'm open to it, and we've talked about it. Obviously, there's a, so many things that would have to come into it, but I could see doing it again. Obviously, not like we did. <coughs> we wouldn't want to, you know. You couldn't if we wanted to. We couldn't repeat what we did. Wouldn't be interested in that. But in some way, shape, or form, we've talked about you know doing another type of cable access show in the Flint area if we if we can. It would be difficult, you know, again, things happened when they did happen because of a lot of different people, and I don't know if I could, you could ever replicate that again. I mean, there was a lot of very talented people. But who'd people, want to, you know? I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, just, you know, the technical side, if these people are interested, uh -huh. I mean, it, you know, but it's something, yeah, we've talked about because, uh, you know, we're older and we're wiser and we could do even sillier things than we did before. Or, and sillier, obviously, but I mean, uh, you know, without like going into a whole lot of details, I mean, obviously, I don't think it would be as music based anymore. Number one, there's not as think, many yeah, bands. I don't think there's the scene anymore. And you know, I've always had this idea of why not like a, a semi talk show in Flint, but you know, but with the real people or just the average Joe, you know, and and we would have waitresses and shop rats and you know, maybe even drug dealers and, and strippers, you know, whatever, Hopefully, you know, just yeah. you know. Well, yeah, hopefully drug dealers. Oh, you meant strippers. Yeah. Oh, well, both. 
I'm so I, uh, away from it. Detached, that, you know. I, I I wouldn't know even if it existed or not. It doesn't, you know. I don't know. I I live 200 miles away, and I just I mean I don't. I'm 52 years old, and I wouldn't even. I don't even know, you know. Yeah, I go to shows now, and I put in earplugs and things like that because you know this tinnitus and going to too many rock shows. Where you, know, do, you, you go you to ride. shows? Well, I mean, when I occasionally do one a year or two a year or whatever. You well, know, it's, you, it's from those the only shows ride, I go to is concerts and you know the Herb Fest, you know. Yeah, and it, and that stuff seems doggone it. It seems like a, unnecessarily loud nowadays. <laughs> Why do these kids got Why to can't bash we just, away? Yeah, you know, on their get, guitars and. Why can't we just hear some crisp combos that you know you can talk over, you know, just like cocktail this. music? Yeah. But these kids and their wacky amplifiers and their six 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 devil worship stuff. Oh <laughs> Lord, I don't get it. What I got out of it, and you know, and I noticed this early on. I liked the fact that I was working with young people who were creative, intelligent, and had a sense of humor. I got so much. And young. <laughs> There were benefits with the young ladies, also yes. But I, I like being ladies. around. Ladies, <laughs> I didn't specify. I liked being around these people. I mean, you know, nothing against what I was doing prior to that. But all of a sudden, I was exposed to, like I said, people who were intelligent and funny and creative, and they were doing it for the right reasons. They enjoyed what they were doing, and they were passionate about it. And I met incredible people, and that's what I got out of it. For me personally, I mean, I got to hear a lot of cool music. I got to hang out with a lot of cool people, and you know, and help them along the way. But I got much more out of it than I ever, you know, put into it or anybody. You know, I, I, I that's why I did it. And it was one of those things that you don't really anticipate. It's like, yeah, you know, let's go do this. But the people that I met were just I wouldn't have met otherwise. What I get out of it is like, you know, you, you can use the word legacy or or whatever. I just you know, I think of in my generation, the, the Pete Kavanaugh's and the Bob Dells and how much they meant to me. And if, and every once in a while I'll run into a kid at a bar, or, yeah, I call him a kid, but you know, now they'd be like a 35 you know, year old man or woman. And they'll say, man, I used to listen to Take No Prisoners every, that was my fix. And, and that's my reward, you know, if there's a legacy there, it's like, you know, and hopefully, you know, that's still going on in some form somewhere, you know, you know, it, it was just our turn to do it, and I was so grateful that, you know, I got to uh, be a part of it and, and be a, a, a major contributor to it and walk in the footsteps of who I perceive to be, you know, great men in the Flint area, in the Flint music scene, the Bob Dells, the Pete Kavanaugh's, and Peter C., of course, the utmost, you know. And... Uh, I mean, it also gave me just a, a great, it, it, a creative outlet, you know. It really, I think, saved me in a lot of ways from some of my worst tendencies, you know. I mean, uh, you know, to be bluntly honest, like substance related. I don't know if I, you know, not had the radio and TV show, you know, uh, you know, I probably would just sat in bars all that time, you know. God knows I spent enough time in them as it was, but I mean, it really gave me something to look forward to and feel good about myself. Gave some and, discipline. And feel like and, yeah. I was a part of something yeah. and, that meaningful. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, there were so many great people and so many great bands. To just know that, you know, uh, I was able to contribute and be there, you know, that if that's a legacy, whatever, you know. It's, uh, it's you know, a golden part of my life. And, and I probably won't ever have it any more fun. I do. I do want to add something because you know, thinking and, re and remembering that um, I always approach these, these, you know, these younger kids or whatever who are in bands or whatever. The younger ones, um, I think, by putting them on the radio, putting them on TV, it encouraged them to go out and try something that, or to give them confidence to to move on and, and hopefully, you know, without getting mundane about it, it inspired them to try other things in their life at some point. To think that you know, instead of being uh, intimidated by, well, I'm not good enough to be on the radio. I'm not good enough to be on the TV or show. Uh, to, it's like if you got an idea and if you're you know passionate about it, you know we'll give you this venue and you can go ahead and do it. And I think, uh, hopefully, it gave you know some people some confidence to you know help them throughout their life. But 
I had a blast. Yeah, it was fun. It was it was great.